Boa noite. Good morning, everyone. I'm Saurabh Fekhi, the Senior Computational Scientist Team Lead at the Kaus Supercomputing Core Lab. And welcome you to the IBEX 101 training. So that's an introductory course uh, for those who just joined Kaus or starting their adventure with high performance computing and supercomputing here at Kaus. And uh, we'll be discussing today on IBEX, and next week we'll cover the Shaheen supercomputing facility as well. Um, so our agendas today will include a variety of uh, topics that we will cover, mostly from the user side, uh, including starting with an introduction on supercomputing and very basic architectural overview of IBEX our cluster here that we uh, will work on. And then we move on to the software environment on the system. Uh, once that's covered, we will go through some scripts and best practices on job management and submissions and monitoring. Uh, then we will move on to the applications. Uh, so we'll give one sample example that will um, give you an idea on how the whole workflow uh, from what you learned previously works uh, and then we'll close by some of the best practices documentation and how to seek support uh, from the supercomputing core lab um, the sessions are meant to be more interactive and practical so there will be some demos uh, that will help you see it live and how things uh, works uh, on the system uh, and hopefully that will give you some good guidance to use the system the most efficiently possible to accelerate scientific discovery and your research. Um, so moving forward in 2022, we will start implementing a policy where uh, the access to IBEX will be, uh, will be uh, granted after uh, attending this particular training, IBEX 101, and passing a very simple quiz at the end. So we'll have the first, uh, for the first time, this uh, very short quiz. So hang on to the end so that you don't have to do it in the future once the policy is announced uh, and implemented. Uh, we are always open to Q&A, whether after each session or at the end, and we'll leave our contacts for any future questions for everyone uh, here today. All right, so that's IBEX 101 on this morning. Um, in the afternoon, we'll move to more advanced sessions uh, on best practices on some of the most prominent and most used applications on IBEX specifically, namely bioscience and deep learning. And uh, we have Dr. Nagara Jankathirasan, who is an expert in supporting the computation biology workloads on IBEX, working with various centers from the Red Sea to uh, Center of Desert Agriculture to CBRC and move on, on, and more. Um, we'll cover the best practice on how to run bioinformatics workflows on cluster IBEX. And then we move on to the GPU components that is mostly used by the deep learning and AI community. And we have Mohsen from KSL and David Pru from, from the uh, Kaust Viz Lab. And uh, they will work together to explain and share with you the best practices on running deep learning workloads on IPEX and using the GPUs the most efficient possible. Uh, but obviously the prerequisites for those, you need to know IPEX from ins and out. So we will start with a very basic introduction to what is supercomputing. Uh, for those who just joined us, and then we'll move on to a very brief architectural overview of IBEX, which, which gives you an idea on how the other pieces will fit together uh, in the larger scheme of things. All right, so just as a very high level introduction of KSL, the Kaos Supercomputing Lab, what we do and what we aim at, basically, we provide state-of-the-art supercomputing facilities, mainly Shaheen and IBEX, and some peripheral systems as well, uh, training and support services to the students, faculty, researchers at KAUST, 
as well as within the kingdom. Um, and our goal is to become a world-class reference and supercomputing center uh, and uh, uh, the main reference in the kingdom. So what we provide in terms of services here is our three layers kind of uh, uh, services. The first is infrastructure, the computing infrastructure and storage and associated services with that. Um, that's the part where we work with the users and understand the requirement, the applications, the scientists team, uh, which is mine, the working with the users and translating those to architectural um, uh, specifications of what we should procure, implement, and uh, expose to the user and provide those uh, as um, infrastructure uh, in terms of hardware and software. Moving on, that, that doesn't happen uh, without the expertise of a team that is well seasoned on, on supercomputing as well as applications. So we have not only uh, computer scientists uh, within the team, but also domain scientists ranging from computational biology, uh, material science and computational chemistry, and computational fluid dynamics. Lastly, we provide the services. So the services we provide them as computing cycles, uh, as, as, as part of the infrastructure, and then consultancy using this expertise uh, with massive uh, experience in various science areas and, and HPC. Uh, the education training is a big part of that. Um, so that's today is one of the training that we offer, but we also cover advanced topics such as in the afternoon, but other, uh, we listen to you guys, there will be a survey after today, and we keep refining our offering in terms of education training. Not only we provide those uh, training by our staff, but also we collaborate and work with our partners uh, and technology providers such as Intel, NVIDIA, AMD, and HPE, and Supermicro, and more uh, to provide uh, their expertise as well uh, and uh, share with you the latest in, in those technologies. Um, we also worked to build a community of supercomputing. We have Slack channels, for example, on different uh, areas with for IBEX and, and other computing topics. Um, we also uh, work at the national level in the Saudi HPC and AI conference, where we provide where we hosted it in 2012 and 2017. Um, but also we. Uh, are very well engaged with the community at large here, uh, providing consultancy as well to Kingdom constituents. Last but not least, uh, our staff here not only provide the basic support, but also advanced support and providing even additional value to the to on, on our services, uh, including the customized workflows and uh, new technologies coming uh, in the in the, in the future, and we do a lot of proof of concepts and a lot of new additional services that meets the needs and the requirement of the KAUST HPC community. Uh, with that said, I move on to the IBEX, one of our infrastructure that is the most heterogeneous and the most rich and the most current in terms of technology, since the model in IBEX is to upgraded every one or two years with novel technology. So that's a model that keep us uh, very current with the latest technologies and very reactive to the user needs uh, in terms of computational and storage requirements. Uh, as opposed to Shaheen, which is a large scale supercomputing facility aiming at uh, very large massive uh, applications running at very large scale. Uh, and that's uh, a different mode that you can see in the next week, uh, in February 17, uh, the training on Shaheen 101. So what is supercomputing in a nutshell? So typically users who are stuck with their workstation and would run indefinitely or very uh, absurd uh, amount of time uh, uh, or have significant storage requirements that wouldn't fit in a typical workstation, uh, the solution is only to go to supercomputers. So those are massive infrastructures 
that provide, that provide the state of the art technologies in computing and storage systems. Um, how that works, so basically the architecture is in an abstract way is as you can see in this cartoon, uh, you have a bunch of computing nodes, right? So they can be homogeneous or heterogeneous. Um, these are tightly connected with the high-speed interconnect uh, between them and between other, con other, other subsystems, uh, mainly the high-performance storage, uh, which is typically a parallel file system that can cater uh, the requirements for large number of clients, which are the, these compute nodes, as well as data movers to talk to the external world uh, and to other small systems. So here we have the login nodes, which are basically the first entry and the first system that you, you get into uh, once you access the system. And from there, you can prepare your scripts, interact with a, a piece of software that runs on a specific server that we call a scheduler or a workload manager. And from there, you start preparing your uh, scientific application to run it on, on these compute nodes and store your data in and out on, on the massive storage here. So specifically for IBEX, we have a quite heterogeneous uh, computing architectures, and that's mainly because we adapt to the requirements and the technology and the growth. Uh, so those are historically, if you can see uh, on the CPU nodes, we, we started with Intel Skylake uh, with 100 nodes of those. Uh, and then we moved on to Cascade Lake. It's a minor upgrade in technology uh, that is slightly more power efficient. But then in, in the last year, a uh, couple of years, uh, AMD came up with AMD ROM, which is quite significant improvement in terms of number of cores with 128 in a single node. Uh, that's 264 CPUs and 512 gigabytes of memory. So that was a, a, a paradigm shift, especially for computational biology, which requires typically massive genome data. Uh, and that's, that's, that's very well served with those uh, AMD nodes. Uh, sometimes we reach a point where even 512 gigs are not enough in terms of memory. We planned uh, 18 very large memory nodes up to three terabytes uh, of uh, main memory each. Uh, this is not disk, this is just memory uh, for the very, very large uh, runs, especially assembly, for example, in computational biology or uh, mesh creation and visualization and partitioning for CFD kind of workloads. Then we come to the GPU world for uh, mainly for AI, but also for several HPC workloads. Uh, we started our journey with, with um, in 2017 with Pascal, uh, 1080 Ti, Geoforce, and 2080. But then we quickly upgraded to the latest and greatest GPUs with massive amount of uh, HBM memory, the high bandwidth memory within the GPU. With V100, uh, they have 32 GPU stack. Uh, we have two configuration of four GPU per node or eight GPU per nodes. Uh, and then we did the same uh, this year uh, with uh, A100, which, which we started in beta testing now. Uh, you will see more into our slides. Uh, and that has 80 gigabytes of high bandwidth memory and up to a terabyte uh, of main memory within a single server. Um, so that's uh, our computing nodes. Uh, we'll see that all the pieces later will interact with each other. So. Uh, in terms of scheduling a job on these compute nodes, you will have specific flags. Uh, when you need a software stack, you will need to use a proper software stack. You will see that in the next talk. Uh, and then to achieve performance, uh, you need to use the proper software libraries uh, and compilers. So moving on to storage, which is one of the major aspects because typically users uh, not only need the space, but also performance. So we cater here for IBEX multiple storage solutions, uh, not only for best performance, but also for features. Uh, so there are some specific features for different kinds of storage. Uh, 
Home directory, for example, uh, is the one that is snapshotted, that has more redundancy, and uh, whether you can secure your source codes typically, and when you start working on your scripts. Then for your scientific data, you have two file systems, the fast scratch, which is based on pure SSDs. Uh, we have a small capacity now and a Weka IO new file system that is still in beta testing. Uh, so, so the Weka IO, you can have access to it on the A100 beta testing system. It's more or less still at the moment, not quite integrated with IBEX, but uh, from now till roughly March, late of March, uh, we will have that all fully integrated with the full system. And we keep adding more storage systems. Um, so the Weka IO provide the highest performance possible, both in bandwidth and number of operations per second. And then for capacity, we have today BGFS uh, for with four petabytes of capacity, and we will upgrade it to a new storage system uh, in, in the late 2022. Uh, and then last but not least is uh, for specific workloads that requires encryption. Uh, one example is when you work on human genome, the uh, ethic uh, committee here at KAUST uh, enforce uh, that these data should be stored in encrypted uh, media. And therefore we have up to four petabytes of uh, encrypted data storage for these kind of, kind of needs. We keep upgrading those. So if, if there are additional requirements, we will keep adapting our solution uh, and our architecture. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, we need to have uh, the, all these components tightly connected. So we chosen the Infiniband uh, Mellanox uh, switch, which is a director switch with have, which has 800 ports, so we can have 800 endpoints at 200 gigabits per second. So that's massive bandwidth. Not only bandwidth is a matter of, of, of importance, but also we have uh, a great topology that, that, that link all these components next to each other with the lowest number of hops when you are Com communicating between two different components, but also very, very low latency. We were talking about lower than three microseconds in terms of latency uh, in any case, uh, which provide really high performance and scalability for your applications. Uh, in terms of uh, MPI communication, that's between nodes, but also for IO, when you're reading and writing files to your storage file system, uh, we've seen that the performance has increased significantly uh, up to a 40 gigabytes per second uh, in the latest upgrade once we installed this director switch. So this is what we call the high performance uh, network, H HSN. Uh, then we come to the ethernet, which is the traditional connectivity within campus. Uh, the advantage there is that IBEX is very well connected to different, uh, to the whole backbone of Chaos Network. Uh, and therefore, it not only connects you to the workstation in a fast way, but also to other uh, equipment such as the cryo electronic microscopy or the biosequencers uh, in our uh, sister core labs, the BCL and ICL core labs. In terms of software stack, in a very nutshell, uh, we'll go more extensively in the in the in the in the next slides and then the next presentation by the team. The OS is CentOS. Uh, workload manager is Slurm, and we support for now Singularity Container. We are working on POCs to other container support. Then comes compilers, libraries, and applications. We have more than four hundred packages prepared that by the team here. Uh, for you guys to use and from various compilers to MPI libraries, which we use, uh, math libraries and many applications, both commercial and open source. So with that, uh, I would like to conclude my part. And if you have questions, please send them to the Q&A. And if you want to interact, let us know. We can give you um, uh, voice access um, to uh, interact with us. and. Then let's move on to the next step, which is 
digging deeper into the software environment on IBEX uh, with our next speaker. Thank you. Moving on. Yeah, sure. I'm bringing up the video. Cool. And I will start tackling any Q&A we have. So the team is answering uh, on live once questions are answered. Uh, but please, you have a Q&A buttons that you can do. And uh, you can raise hand if you want to speak up or send us a message uh, on the chat. Thank you. Um, let us know if you have issues uh, listening to the audio uh, in the chat or okay. Now with the software environment overview, a question that we usually receive is that, do I need to apply for an account to use IVEX? The answer is simply no. Any cast member with valid cast credentials should be able to directly log in and use IVEX. To check the validity of your credentials, please try to log into either the CAUS portal or the web link. The portal looks something like this. You'll find the login part on your left. And the web main looks like this. If for any reason you couldn't log in to these portals, or you could, but you couldn't log into the cluster, Mohsen, the audio is not great. Right. Um, something is. Apologies for this technical glitch, but uh, we're going to get it solved promptly. Uh, was it working for everyone? Initially, but after a few minutes, it was. Yeah. How about, lost, how about now? Can you see the no, we video don't see now? Anything. No, you're not sharing. Yes. I'll do it in a second. So there is a question on the chat, so I will answer it while you do that. So uh, I know there are limits in CPUs or the GPUs a user uh, can use at once. Uh, are these limits counted separately? I believe so. And is there the formula of max CPU and GPUs? Um, uh, so yeah. I don't yeah, uh, Sabar, I will be actually covering uh, the limit on CPU and GPU in the best practices session. Fantastic. Awesome. Yeah. So we'll have a look into that. But uh, in, in the meanwhile, any... yeah. Uh, sorry, Sabar. In the meanwhile, I will try to answer this question. Go ahead. Yeah. Thanks, Sabar. Yeah, we are online. We still don't see your screen, Marcel. Yep, it's coming up. Contact IT. So how to log into the cluster based on your operating system? For macOS and Linux users, you can use the native terminal program. You'll find it installed by default on both of these systems. For Microsoft Windows users, you'll need to use a third party SSH client like Putty or Mobile Xterm. 
Please note that Mobile Extreme is an enhanced terminal which also runs an X11 server. Unlike Putsi, you need to install that separately, something like Xming. Upon successful login, you'll find our message of the day. It contains any information or updates the team wants to share with you. For example, any upcoming maintenance sessions for the dates and times, so you can schedule your jobs accordingly. You'll also find any updates related to the app stack, like replicating some set of apps. Upon your first login to the cluster, you'll receive a welcome email with, with some useful information. For example, your storage spaces, your home and your scratch, the size of each, you'll find our support channels. You'll also find some useful documents like the IBEX and STERM cheat sheets. Now with a quick overview on the software available on IBEX. Every user has two options. The first is to have a local installation so you can customize it as much as you can. The second option would be to ask for the installation and the IBEX team will work on having the most common or general modes of installation. The, the software on IBEX is managed through environment modules you'll find more than 400 modules available on different app stacks. The most common subcommands are the following. Module AV or avail with no arguments will list all the modules available for use. Module AV or avail with string is used to check the availability of a module that starts with that string. Module load or add will add that module to your environment. Module unload or RM will remove it from your environment. Module swap or switch swaps between two modules. Module purge will remove all the loaded modules from your current session. Module list will list the currently loaded modules Module show views what the module is supposed to change in your environment. An example for module avail with no arguments. Example for module avail CUDA. Then module load one of the available CUDA modules. Module list will show that module. Module purge will remove everything. The module list again will show that you're currently not loading anything. For a module like Python 3.7.0, you can check what the module is going to change in your environment when you load it by module show Python 3.7.0. You'll find the environment variables that will be changed upon loading. Please note that some tools are already available on the system by default, like Python and GCC. So to make sure that you're using the loaded module, not the systems one, check, for example, which Python. That will print the full path to the Python binary that you'll be using when you type Python in your terminal. We can categorize our software stack based on different criteria by the processor type, by size domain, or by the module role. The software stack by processor. As you may know, IBEX is a hybrid cluster of different processors, Intel, AMD, and GPU. So the software stack can vary accordingly. For each type, there is a dedicated login node with the available software stack. To check the Intel software stack, login to ilogin.ibex.caust.edu.sa. 
for the GPU related software stack. Login to glogin.ibex.caust.edu.sa. On IBEX, we have different modules for different science domains. For example, the biosciences, chemistry, CFD, deep learning, electrical engineering, and cryo-electron microscopy. The software stack by role, the module can be part of the software development or the libraries, or the applications, or a container. And for that, we use Singularity. Thank you. So we'll answer the questions at the end uh, of the session, uh, unless there is something uh, that uh, the panelists would like to add. Moving on, we are going to uh, do some demos now. So bear with me, uh, I'll do the, start the demo for uh, Conda environment. We, we don't see the screen. Yeah, in, in, a, in a second, in a second. Sure, just letting you. Yeah. Sharing now. Hello everyone, this is Aitan Ismail, KSL Application Specialist, presenting more on the module file systems on IBEX. One of the most used modules on the GPU application stack on glogin is the machine learning module. It is a single module containing all the most widely used machine learning packages, such as that, carrots, pandas, and more. For a complete list of available packages, Check the link pointing to the GitHub repository. This module file is updated biannually prior to the start of a new semester. It is mainly intended to help new users to get started as quickly as possible with running jobs on IBEX. But for the more experienced users who need specific version requirements and additional packages, Conda should be used to manage their software stacks and create their own environments. Conda is an open source environment and package management system. It is used to create, load, and switch between environments, and also to install, run, update packages within the created environment. The Conda Forge channel is where the most scientific software lives. It's kind of the Wikipedia for open source software. For a live demo on how to install Conda in your IBEX home directory, check the link pointing to the GitHub. To learn and understand more about Conda and PIP and how to manage your own software stack on IBEX, check the following links. For data science project templates, there is a collection of templates available on GitHub where you can find all the best practices. You can also find examples on Conda environment configuration files, Slurm scripts to create Conda environments, launch Jupyter servers, and launch training jobs. As a conclusion, always when in doubt, start with the machine learning module. And when you are ready and confident to manage your own software stack, start using Conda, then transition to the project templates. Thank you. Thank you, Aitan. Next is two demos, um, which uh, elaborate how to SSH from different operating systems. So let's uh, try those. So this is for um, Linux. Sank, should you wish, wish to uh, add My something? Yes. Uh, so guys, as it's shown here, uh, we're trying to log in using the native terminal program on the 
Linux, we logged into iLogin and GLogin. As we mentioned earlier, there's different app stacks for uh, these. Uh, it's very simple to use on Linux, but maybe on Windows and Mac systems, there's just a bit uh, difference. Um, uh, we use a third party tool uh, for uh, the export holding. Um, can you, Mohsen, please show us? Uh, so this was Linux. Yes. Now moving on to Windows. So for Windows, uh, the very simplest thing to use is a mobile XTERM. It's a terminal incorporated with um, um, an X11 server. Uh, you'll usually need the X11 if you want to uh, open a GUI, like a G-Edit or something on the, on the cluster and um, show it on your uh, um, uh, local machine. Uh, that's briefly the, the, the definition of the X4 holding. So on Windows here, we're using mobile XTERM. And uh, similarly, we're trying to uh, log into um, both login nodes that we have. As you may know, uh, you do SSH and use your username uh, on the cluster and then uh, the host name. That was it uh, for Windows. Um, Mac. We do this. It's just to show uh, the different tools on different systems. Uh, if you have any questions so far, please uh, let us know. Here, as you can see, uh, uh, when we uh, SSHing into the cluster, it requested a password and uh, the user entered it here. Um, there is a, a, a solution for that if you want to configure a more uh, easy and secure way to log into the cluster that we'll see in the next uh, demo. Some of you may be familiar with it as uh, the passwordless authentication and SSH keys, but let's get into that uh, later. Now for G login, it requested the password again, and just upon entering the right one, you'll be there. Okay. Uh, for um, our uh, passwordless authentication. Um, as I mentioned, it's it's um, an easier way uh, because you'll be using the, the cluster frequently. And maybe if you don't need to enter the password each time, you configure uh, SSH keys between the local machine and the remote machine, which is the IBEX cluster. As you can see here, I try to SSH without configuring anything. It requested a password. I entered it. I'm there. Okay, now I logged out and I'm on my local machine that I connect to the cluster from. I use a command called SSH keygen. It creates the SSH uh, keys, both uh, private and public ones, as you can see. Now the next step is called SSH copy ID. And that copies 
my public ID to the remote machine so it can interact with the local machine. For this step, it's similar to the SSH one. It will request the password and that should be the last time to enter it. Now that was added successfully, the key to the remote machine. I'll try again to SSH to my machine and didn't request the password. Thanks, Pasan. Um, so now we are going to talk about the module system. So yes, uh, I think Pasan, you're gonna uh, talk about that too, right? Yes. So as we uh, saw in the uh, presentation, how to uh, use the module system, it's a very important tool to um, uh, manage the modules on the IBEX. That's the module avail, which uh, without giving any arguments, it lists everything that's installed. And as you can see, it's a long output. If you're looking for a specific piece of software, you just provide the, the, the first string uh, of that uh, name. So as you can see, module avail Intel, it will show the Intel compilers, also the Intel MPI, because it starts with the word Intel and there are Intel stacks that are listed um, uh, too. Now I tried to load one of these uh, Intel compilers and with module list, I can show it. Uh, it's active in my environment. I can use uh, uh, the tool. Now module purge, as we remember, it removes everything for from the session and with module list, I can confirm that. Now we're trying something. I'm trying to check the GCC uh, modules available. And I'll try to show one of these modules what's going to be changed in my environment when this is loaded. Now trying a different thing. I'm loading GSL and checking uh, with module list it shows that it loads by default GCC 640 as a dependency. I can unload that one. And that's how we uh, check the dependencies for a module. So it's either I remove the dependencies, mod the modules one by one, or I can do module purge and uh, just clear the environment from any loaded modules. You can also use another version of GCC if you need by uh, unloading the current one or the default one and loading any other version. So <clears throat> the next one will be to check uh, the differences between the Python. So which Python shows the system one is in, installed under uh, slash USR. I'm checking the available Python modules and loading one of them. Please pay attention to the message printed upon loading a module. And now with which Python again, I'll find this is the uh, custom installed one in the software directory. I hope it's clear and uh, for sure, if you have any questions, just shoot us.
Great, uh, thanks, Prasant. Uh, moving on, uh, we'll talk about um, the job scheduling. And let me download this for a few minutes. So I hope uh, this is visible. And I'll be presenting the job scheduling session on IBEX. Uh, so, uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Mohsen Ahmed Sheikh. I'm one of the computational scientists at KSL. And what I'll be talking about is basically what a scheduler is and how to interact with it uh, on IBEX. So, uh, a scheduler, job scheduler, is meant to um, make use of uh, the resources available on a machine like IBEX in a fair manner. And uh, it, it, it is there to actually keep everyone uh, uh, happy, hopefully, but keeping the machine busy so that the rate of uh, return of the investment is uh, high. So in order to use a scheduler, you may need to change your workflow uh, uh, in order to uh, align with the policies. Um, and uh, that involves uh, automating most of this stuff. And I'll show you in a little bit because uh, most of the time the scheduler is running things on your behalf rather than uh, you yourself are doing things. So uh, Sabir has aptly uh, discussed what uh, IBEX cluster is and how heterogeneous it is. But just to, just to elucidate, uh, we've got quite a few types of uh, CPU nodes and, uh, and, and, a, and, and a large list now of GPU nodes as well uh, with different host uh, architectures. So it, it is a big machine with uh, lots of options. And uh, we use uh, Slurm as a job scheduler, which is uh, basically a resource manager. And it allows complex uh, scheduling algorithm uh, to be implemented and manifested in your job resource request. Uh, what it does is it actually provides you uh, a way of describing your jobs, what you want. Uh, and then you can prescribe how your workload should actually run on the requested resource when it is available. You can then monitor the job as well when it is submitted. And this uh, gives us a mechanism to charge your job in terms of the unit metric uh, and then deduct it from your total allocation to keep things um, in control in terms of making everyone uh, have the similar experience on the system. So the first thing that we would like to uh, visit is how to query the system through Slurm. And the first friendly uh, command uh, that I'll introduce is sinfo. Uh, sinfo, uh, and the prefix s basically uh, in the command here uh, shows that it is a Slurm command. Uh, it actually shows a complete uh, picture of the whole system uh, what is available, what is allocated, and what is down, for example, for some reasons like maintenance or uh, temporarily down in drain, drain state because the system is re, uh, reinvigorating the node. Um, it, it does not, it, it depends which uh, node your login node you are on, but uh, at the end of the day, because Slurm is uh, running on both login nodes, the same Slurm is running on both login nodes, you'll be able to see pretty much the same view. There is a convenience uh, command that uh, only G login node will uh, show its uh, output as, uh, or relevant, let's put it that way, is. Uh, and that is for GPUs. So what is the status of uh, usage of GPUs on IBEX at the moment? So GInfo will help you there. It's a wrapper uh, developed in-house. And here you can see different kinds of GPUs are listed and their status. Um, so this basically is something that one would run when uh, you have submitted a job and you're waiting for the job to run for a long time. Uh, and the uh, job scheduler is telling you, I'm waiting for resources, but you would like to see how busy is the system from a GPU perspective, and this is the perspective that you get. And it has a few more options, so you can actually use minus minus help to actually see the syntax and the options. Another useful command uh, that is uh, of consequence most of the time is once you have submitted a job, you would like to see what's the status of your job at that time. And SQ, 
uh, is that command and you can filter that command through uh, adding, adding some uh, options. The first uh, friendly option is minus U and your username and it will only show your uh, jobs. You can see uh, if there is a particular partition that you would like to see. Batch is the general partition uh, that it will show and uh, a job ID. So if you want to see the status of a particular job ID, you could do that too uh, using uh, the filter. Right, moving on. Um, okay, so it looks like I'm going too fast. Um, so moving on, uh, once you have queried the system, um, you've submitted a job and you can monitor the system. Uh, how to specify the resources is something that we would like to learn too. And uh, before getting into that, I would like to explain that the SLAM actually looks at uh, resources as resource pools. So it actually uh, categorizes the resources. Uh, some of them are CPU resources, the other are GPU resources, i.e. through their architecture. <clears throat> through their market micro architecture within the pool, you can have multiple GPUs and within the pool, you can have multiple CPUs as well. So you can describe your job resource request uh, in, in, in those terms. Um, and uh, for that, we use uh, a keyword called constraints or features. And you can have a look at what features and constraints are available for a certain node, a particular node. Let's say, for example, here uh, I am uh, querying S info with uh, some filters to actually list all the constraints that are available on a CPU node, or here in this situation, a GPU node. So uh, I have I have highlighted that um, uh, this node can be obtained in job by actually um, describing the constraint as cascade lake. Uh, and if uh, you wanted a, a GPU node with cascade lake architecture host, then you will be adding a constraint like this. Right? Um, so in order to request uh, resources from a resource pool, you can actually request the resource in term, in four terms. One is the CPUs. The other one is GPUs. You can request memory, and then you can also request uh, time. And this is a mandatory request that you must have in your job, whether it is interactive or batch processing job, right? So, um, There are two modes you can interact with Slum uh, to get the resources. One, obviously we have been telling uh, uh, that this is a batch system. So you can actually script your whole workload, including the request of the resources and then submit it to Slum. And that's called a batch mode. Slum will obtain that uh, request, uh, allocate that node or allocate that request resource uh, that you have requested and then run the rest of the script, the bash script on top of it uh, as workload on your behalf. The other one is, the other mode is that you request, but you request it uh, to be given to you in an in interactive mode. And this will basically, when the job is allocated, it will give you a prompt, and then you can interact with that resource directly uh, line by line. Um, there are implications of uh, using uh, the two, uh, any of the two modes. Uh, in batch mode, you should be ready to uh, script your whole workflow, which means to say you're doing deterministic things. So you would have tested things already, uh, and then you know uh, what steps are there, and then you will do the scripting step by step and then submit the job. And in this scenario, uh, it's kind of a fire and forget kind of scenario where you will script you will submit and basically you can go home, not waiting for the job to actually run uh, and then you need to be sitting there. Once the job is finished, it, the outputs will be generated, including uh, the standard out will be written to a file as well. And you can log into the machine anytime and then uh, retrieve the information. 
Whereas um, an, an, an interactive job would require you to be in front of your machine when the job is allocated, when the resource are, uh, resources are available that you have requested, the prompt will be given to you and for that amount of time, uh, what you have requested for, and you will start interacting with it. Now, uh, interactive jobs are uh, meant to be uh, in a prototyping scenario where you are actually trying to discover what you must do in your batch mode. Um, and uh, these are short-lived jobs and they are small-scale jobs most of the time. So uh, keep that in mind when you're actually asking for resources uh, and you're blocking resources when you're not using them and it is an interactive resource, it is not being allocated to someone else. So this is a, uh, this is a kind of a caution that one would take that when you're doing interactive work, uh, do it for a prototyping purpose and try and submit uh, batch jobs as much as you can. So here is an example of a general job script. Uh, here we are asking for um, a single GPU with one uh, process running uh, on host. And we want a GPU of a particular type that is V100 here. So we are uh, adding a constraint uh, directly. Now the construct of the job script, which is basically a file is that you start with hash as batch, uh, hash bin bash. So this will start a shell with minus L saying that you can actually inherit, it can inherit your login shell. Uh, and uh, moving on, it has a, a job name uh, directive. So you can call that anything, it's up to you, uh, whatever, uh, however meaningful it would be for you. Um, this job name will also occur, uh, appear in the SQ uh, command output. You can add uh, the time. Uh, the syntax of the time is hours, minutes, and seconds. And then um, you can add days in it too, if it is more than 24 hours. Uh, batch partition is default. You can add it here, but if you forget to add it, that's fine. It will go to batch uh, partition anyways on IFX because that's the default partition. Moving on, you ask for one uh, process, uh, one physical core on the uh, host or on the node um, to run one single process. And uh, you need a GPU as I mentioned before. And once this job is submitted and the request has uh, been fulfilled by uh, Slurm and the resources allocated, then Slurm is going to run these two bash commands. It will load the CUDA module and it will uh, run, it will launch the workload. That workload in this case is a hello world program. And S run here is the launcher, job launcher, when uh, a task launcher, let's put it that way. So when the resource is available on that resource, you can launch using SRUN. To submit this job, uh, you use a command called sbatch and the file name. And let's visit uh, this um, sbatch command and look at it, what it is. Basically it is to submit the jobs um, to Slurm. Uh, upon successful submission, you will get a job ID uh, and that job ID can then be queried upon for the status of the job. Um, job is first queued and it awaits its allocation. Hopefully if things are in order, you will get this running uh, instantly, but sometimes it takes time depending on what you have requested and when it is available. Um, on IBEX, uh, we do not have accounting enabled per se. So, so we do not charge you, but we do collect information about that. Uh, what that does also is where it is used is uh, setting priorities. Uh, priorities are something that when you uh, use IBEX more, uh, your priority goes a little low to enable a fair share of distribution of resources. So that if someone comes in at a later stage who has not used their allocation or IBEX, they would be uh, prioritized uh, to run their jobs. Moving on in future, we may actually start uh, accounting uh, for the allocations 
and then uh, those will be finite allocations. The other command that is useful here is once you have submitted a job and you want to kill that job or cancel that job, you can use s cancel and the job ID. So here this workflow shows that I am first querying uh, what is there in the queue. And uh, this is pending at the moment. The PD state is pending and it is pending because of priority. And I say, okay, fine. I want to change this job uh, request to a smaller one so that it gets through uh, in the available uh, resources. And that's exactly what I do. I cancel this job. And then uh, when I query again, the job is no more there. S alloc or selloc is the equivalent of S batch, where S batch was uh, the uh, job submission in batch mode, and S alloc is uh, for interactive job uh, submission or request. So here I am asking for uh, one GPU uh, with one uh, physical core on a GPU that is V100 for 10 minutes, right? and uh, I'm calling it on a partition called debug. So uh, SALOC uh, allows you to describe your request on the command line as command line arguments. When that is done, um, when that is done, when the job is granted, that means the allocation is available, you can uh, run your uh, workload step by step. So in the first, uh, I'm, I'm actually uh, loading the module, um, setting up the environment, and then I launch my workload that is uh, device queries and application uh, with the configuration of how it should be uh, launched. So minus N1 says run one instance of my application on the said uh, resources or allocated resources. This prints out uh, some information. In this scenario, because I'm working interactively, my uh, output will be populated on standard out. But if you were running it in batch mode, that would go in a file and you can discover that file on the file system. Once you're done, you can type exit, press enter, and you will be out of the uh, job that was allocated to you. And that will free up the node for someone else. Right, using the allocated resources, as I mentioned before, inside the job, uh, either it is interactive or it is batch, you can use SRUN to basically uh, configure how each application or each step of your job should run. You can have a multi-step workload where different steps need different resources that were allocated to the job. So say, for example, in this interactive session, I'm asking for four physical CPUs with each CPU having access to 10 other CPUs. So in, in, in total, I'm asking for 40 of them, right? And uh, this, is, this happens to be a multi-threaded application uh, which can run uh, in parallel. So I'm asking for 10 minutes, uh, this kind of uh, uh, allocation. When it is granted to me, what I do is I do my pre-processing step, for example, on a single core, right? Because that's not a parallel step, that's a sequential step. And then comes the uh, parallel step, which is multi-threaded, which means each instance or each process of my uh, application can launch uh, 10 threads. And I'm launching four of these processes with 10 threads and then uh, the solver uh, is my application that I've launched. Once I'm done, I press exit, uh, I type exit and I get out of the uh, allocation. Okay. So <sighs> launching the jobs is fantastic. We can query the system as well, but we would like to monitor our jobs as well. And here, as I mentioned before, SQ is a very friendly uh, tool, utility, uh, which uh, allows filtering on your job ID or your username to list the jobs and their, uh, their uh, status. It also gives some information on the reasoning. If the job is running, that's fine. If the job is uh, pending, what is the reason? 
So there are set uh, predefined reasons uh, in, uh, and then you can do manual SQ or MAN man SQ uh, to actually discover the reasons, what they mean. S control during the lifetime of the job, S control is a very useful utility to discover how the job was submitted, right? What were the metrics that were added in the submission? So here, for example, the job ID and the other attributes are populated, including your request. So for example, I requested 16 CPUs. I was given memory of 115 gigabytes. Uh, and if I had uh, added something which has a GPU request, that would also show here, so on and so forth. So this is a useful entity or utility to put just in your job script so that uh, for provenance purpose, you can go back to it after let's say two months or three months. How did you actually launch this workload? After the job has finished, uh, there is some information not all of them, but some information uh, that is retained by Slurm for accounting purposes. And you can retrieve that using SACT or, or uh, the accounting tool for Slurm. Uh, that can also be filtered on your username, on the job ID in question, if you know that job ID to get information like, for example, what was the job name? Where did it run and which, on which partition? How many CPUs were allocated to that job and so on and so forth? How did it finish, for example? Um, this one failed, this one timed out, this one was canceled by me, and this one successfully uh, exited. Uh, so uh, that, that gives the exit code as well. You can have a long form and a short form of the report. Uh, the long, for the long form, you can add minus L uh, filter and it will give you a lot more uh, of the metrics that it has. Lastly, I'll uh, visit some example job scripts. So pure CPU uh, job uh, will have um, the definition that is asking for CPUs only. Um, and uh, I'm asking here for one process with each uh, process having access to four cores because this is a multi-threaded job. It will be sitting on the same node uh, and, and it is a shared memory uh, application. And here I am loading my uh, environment, setting up some variables uh, that interacts with the uh, multi-threaded library. And then I launch my application using SRAM. For MPI jobs, uh, if you are familiar with MPI, uh, you will be asking for the number of MPI tasks you want and how many of those tasks you want on the same node. So if you are running on the on a single node, you will be uh, having this n tasks per node or tasks per node. These both are um, ap applicable here. This configuration will give you a single node allocation of architecture uh, of type Intel. And then uh, you will load your environment with OpenMPI and GCC, and then you will launch your uh, application. Uh, but for but for a multi-machine or multi-node job, you can actually say basically I want thirty-two, but I want eight of them on each node. So you can say tasks per node equals eight, and you will get four uh, nodes. You might want to do this because you want more memory per MPI task, in that scenario, you might have to add more. So if you have these kind of workloads, please email us and we'll work with you to write the correct job script. There are large memory nodes as well. And if you uh, want, you can uh, put this ar argument or directive called minus minus mem and the amount of memory. And if the amount of memory uh, is asked for is more than 370 gigabytes, it uh, automatically goes to a large memory node. This is applicable for both SPatch and SALOC uh, utilities. Here is an example of a single GPU job. And this is agnostic of uh, whether it is a DL workload or it is a simple CUDA workload that uh, HPC uses. 
uh, day in, day out. So here I'm asking for uh, one process with one GPU and the type of GPU that I want is V100 because I know that V100 has 32 gigabytes of GPU memory. And this minus minus mem has nothing to do with the GPU. Again, it is the, G, uh, it is the CPU memory or the host memory that I want because I know that I want my single core to have that much memory to do something like process data or um, so on and so forth. Um, and then I, I load my environment and then I run srun to submit the job. This is an example of four GPU, um, uh, four GPU job. Instead of asking for one GPU, I'm asking for four. And I also uh, direct Islam to give me all four GPUs on the same node. So GPUs per node is equal to four here, right? And uh, launching it uh, would be using srun with minus N4 uh, with minus C, that is uh, per MPI task, I only need one core and then multi GPU uh, application uh, is invoked. The common constraints that uh, we see on, uh, on IBEX being used are, uh, for example, if you want an Intel uh, node, uh, you would put minus minus constraint equals Intel. Uh, if you want a specific Intel architecture, you would then put that to uh, minus minus constraint equals Skylake, for example, or Cascade Lake. You can ask for an AMD node. If you don't want an Intel node, you specifically want AMD, that's where you go. And we have, uh, in, at the moment, we have uh, just one kind of AMD node, node micro, uh, AMD micro architecture, that is uh, Intel, uh, AMD ROM and uh, you can specifically add that and the job will be allocated on an AMD ROM. In terms of GPUs, as I mentioned before, we have got uh, quite a few types, uh, including V100 and A100s. A100 is not general availability at the moment. It is beta test in, uh, in beta testing. So if you have access to it, you should be doing, uh, you should be adding minus minus constraint equals a hundred. And large memory, as I mentioned before. And if you want local disk, you can also uh, request that. Uh, and then it, the job will be allocated on a node which has a uh, local disk of this size of 500 gigabytes. So there are uh, some uh, caveats that you need to know about. Uh, um, and as Saber mentioned, we have got a new file system uh, that is in pipeline, that is in beta testing at the moment. And it will be generally available very soon, like in March, but it has some uh, restriction. And one of the restrictions is that it requires two cores to run on the, the machine or on every node. So uh, a GPU node with four GPUs usually has 32 cores uh, on the host. Two of them are taken by AI. So uh, what's left for you, your job is 30. And Slurm will not allocate more than 30 cores. So this is something to be aware of. Similarly on eight GPU node, you, instead of 48, now you have 46. And a hundred nodes uh, by four nodes, i.e. Uh, four GPU nodes will have 62 instead of 64 CPUs. And uh, uh, the a hundred node with eight GPUs uh, has 126 instead of 128. So a little bit of modification of an existing job script might be in order if you are asking for a large amount of CPUs, uh, CPU cores uh, in your job script. There are a few um, uh, common situations. Why is my job not running? There are a few states. Look at this state and some most, most often you will know why your job is still waiting uh, in pending state, for example. And let's say in this scenario, it is resources, uh, but there could be uh, other uh, predefined 
reasons that you can actually look at the manual page and understand. Or if you have any questions, send us an email and we'll work with you in terms of um, understanding those. So I'm pretty sure there'll be more questions, but we'll wait until the demos for um, for the demos for the Islam usage on IVAX, and then we'll move on to um, the next segment of the session. So Rana, if you are uh, available and ready. Right. So hi everyone. This is Rana, I'm the application specialist. Just a minute, Maslam. Can you repeat it again? Sure. Okay. Uh, first, the checking the resource availability on IPEX as ENFO is used. Showing the partitions available, the maximum time limit, the list of nodes in a specific state. Here is the batch partition and its availability and the node list available in next state. Then to query the status of GPU resources on IPEX, GINFO is used showing the GPU nodes available by their architecture, the total number, the used one, and also the free. Then to get information about jobs in the queue, as queue is used, and here showing all the jobs in the queue, whether they are in a running state or in depending state. And in a running state, you can see the time the job has been running until now, the allocated a node and the node list. To get information about the job for a specific user, a queue can be filtered using the SHU argument. So you can see the jobs, your own jobs. Here the job is running for about 50 minutes. And finally, to know about features and constraints available on nodes on IPEX, as info is used in this way, showing the architecture type, whether the node has GPU or not, whether it's considered as a large, a large memory node or not, and also the local desk storage. This is mainly about checking the resource availability on IPEX. So Mohsen, can we proceed in the next demo? And here is how to run a batch jobs on IPEX, a simple job script for running a simple MPI code on IPEX. First, uh, the SLURM directives to allocate the resources and the MPI run to run the codes on the allocated resources. Submit the job using S patch. Then you will get job ID, specific job ID. Then you can show your own job using SQ. Then finally, to check up the output file of your job, and open the file. And here's the output demonstrates that the codes are running on 32 process as requested. And here is the interactive jobs on IPEX here, requesting a simple interactive shell for one node and four cores. You will find that you are directed after the submission to one of the compute nodes that you are allocated. 
on. You can check via host name. You are what on one of the compute nodes that allocated by slur. So you can start work on this compute node. If you want to exit the interactive shell, just type exit and you will log out and return to the login node again. To request resources using SLOC, here is requesting two nodes. For about one hour, you will find that uh, you are granted job allocation with a specific job ID. And the node ID that allocated by Slurm for you. To start launch of your application on the allocated resources, just use SRAN. And here in the example, we run host name using SRAN, so they are running on the two compute nodes. To release the allocation, just type exit. And here is how to monitor our jobs. SQ is used with your username. showing the name, the status of your job, running for about four minutes. To know more details about your running job, S control is used with your specific job ID. Here you will find information about the allocated nodes, allocated resources, the working diary. To know more about accounting data for your job, as act is used to show the, the jobs running by the user for a recent days and also its job steps. And finally, to cancel your job, you can run SQ just to get the specific job ID for your job that you want to cancel it. Then use as cancel with a specific job ID. Rerun SQ again. You will find that the job is canceled and no job is running now. Thank you all for listening. Thanks a lot, Rana. Uh, now uh, we'll move on to um, MATLAB. And let me um, download this. So Iten will present, Iten Smile will present that. Okay. Hello everyone. This is Iten Smile, HPC application specialist. And I'm here to tell you all about running MATLAB on IBEX. We are going to discuss how to get access to run MATLAB the two modes of running, the interactive mode, which is the nearest mode to working on your workstation, and the batch modes, serial runs and parallel runs. In order to use MATLAB, you need to be added to the KSL MATLAB group. As MATLAB is a licensed software, we had to restrict access to authorized users only. Access to the software is controlled via Shaheen. So in order to grant you access, we need to create an account for you, although you will not use it. Submit the application form along with a scan of your passport and KAUST ID. The form will need to be signed by your PI in the section at the top of page three. You can leave the project and IP address sections blank 
as you will not be logging into the, the Shaheen system. The form can be found on our website at the below link. Let's talk about the modes of running MATLAB. The interactive mode is when you run MATLAB interactively using the GUI. You first have to log into IBEX and don't forget to add the dash X. In here, you do SSH dash X, username at ilogin.ibex.caos.edu.sa or at glogin.ibex.caos.edu.sa. You then have to allocate an interactive node as shown here in the SRAN command. Add any more op options if needed. To check the available versions on the system, do a module avail MATLAB, then module load the desired version, then invoke MATLAB. To be able to open the GUI, make sure you have installed Xcords for Mac. And for Windows users, install Xming or MOBA Xterm. The next slide will show you a demo on how to run interactively. Here we SSH to ibex, ilogin.ibex.caos.edu.sa. The sron command, sron-n1 for the number of nodes, number of tasks for, the time, just one hour, and then this node has been allocated. The module avail MATLAB to show all available versions of MATLAB, then load the desired MATLAB version, then invoke MATLAB. The GUI will then pop up. To run in a batch mode means you create job scripts to run on IBEX using Slurm. You can run a serial code or run a parallel code across multi cores. Here is an example of a batch script to run a serial MATLAB code running on one core, which means using just one worker. Some of the steps that you need to do is to CD to your working directory, create your batch script as mentioned in the next slide, for example, my batch script. Paste the example, save and exit, then as batch my batch script. Here's the example you will paste. Dash N, capital, for one node. Number of tasks per node is one for just one core using one worker. The partition, batch. The job name, test MATLAB. The output file, the error file. The time that you need to complete the job, 20 minutes. The memory that you might need, 40 gigs and the constraint to run on the desired node, which is Intel here. Module load MATLAB, CD to your working directory, then run MATLAB application. To run a parallel code, you need to run across more cores. As a default on MATLAB, if you, put, if you specify any number of cores, it will have a default of 12 workers. In order to overcome this, add the below two lines at the beginning of the .m file so the parallelism is done over the allocated cores. You can run up to 128 cores workers on AMD nodes. Here's an example of a batch script to run a parallel MATLAB code using 40 cores which means 40 workers. The N capital is for one node, the number of tasks is 40, and the rest is the same. Thank you. Thanks, Aitan. Let's move on to the last uh, session. Uh, yeah, also, uh, maybe I will take a control and sure. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, very good. Very good afternoon to all. Uh, are you able to uh, hear clearly, right? 
Mohsan, are you able to see my yes. screen? Yes. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, very good afternoon. Myself, Naga, Computational Scientist in Supercomputing Core Lab. Uh, here, we are actually going to discuss about some best practices, documentation, and support. Uh, so, <clears throat> give me a second. As part of uh, as part of your login node, login node is mainly you mainly used as a shared resource. Meaning is login node is mainly used for editing purpose, compilation purpose, and submitting the submitting the jobs. So please don't run any of your jobs on your on your login node. Uh, if you are actually <clears throat> running the job in login node, um, like someone actually complains, our system admin will terminate your job. So please use batch or interactive job submissions to run your jobs. Uh, here are the limitations on a job scheduling. Uh, say for example, batch partition is actually used by default by most of the users. There is no special partition available at IBEX. Uh, here, fair share allocation is actually used Meaning is, say for example, even the new user or experienced user having a fair share allocation. Uh, the jobs can be scheduled a maximum of 14 days is the time limit. Maximum 200 jobs can be submitted at a time. Uh, and there is no reservation available at IBEX. Uh, even 200 jobs are actually having a maximum limitation. You can actually go with array-based jobs for processing your multiple samples or multiple sequences jobs and so on. Uh, here, the CPU limitation is maximum 24. As Sabar mentioned earlier, uh, we, we are actually going to implement some policies um, like, you know, say, for example, um, we need to actually uh, attend deep learning or machine learning uh, to, better you, better, uh, to better understand how we can actually use the GPU resources. Uh, maximum CPU cores are actually limited with 1024 per user that can be allocated at a time. The maximum memory usable at a time is 16 TB. Uh, at a time. Say, for example, if you are actually looking for more than 16 TB main memory at a time, your job will be a queue. Uh, it may not actually run um, when you are actually, actually allocating more than 16 TB memory. Uh, here, uh, these are uh, the parameters, wall clock time, they already uh, explained uh, during the previous presentation by Mosan, uh, right? Uh, here, the wall clock time is actually specified by a day followed by a dash, hours, minutes, and seconds. Uh, here, you need to actually specify uh, a yeah, maximum wall clock time uh, 14 days. Uh, if you are actually specifying 14 days, uh, the job execution actually takes more time. So better estimate uh, the job completion time for your job. Accordingly, you can actually specify <coughs> the time limitation uh, in your job script file. Uh, in case if your job is not completed, you are feel free to uh, join in the Slack channel. The Slack channel is called extension. Uh, using this extension channel, uh, yourself you can actually extend the job uh, with additional hours. Say for example, um, my initial job allocation is actually one hour. Um, before job termination, you can actually extend using the parameter called slash extend, followed by a job IDs. Say for example, here, uh, once I actually joined in the Slack extension channel, uh, I can actually use slash extend followed my job ID. One, two, three, four, five is one, one of my job ID. And another job ID is 67890. Uh, I can actually extend these two jobs by 25 percentage of time. Uh, meaning is like, no, initial, my uh, initial job allocation is one hour. I can actually extend 15 minutes uh, by using 25 percentage. Alternatively, you can actually use um, the additional wall clock time. The additional wall clock time may not go more than 100% of your initial time. Meaning is my initial time, initial allocation time is one hour. I may not ex actually extend more than one hour time duration. Then uh, CPUs. Uh, in IBEX, we have... Uh, 300 plus GPUs coming from Intel and uh, AMD. Uh, the Skylake and Cascade Lake are uh, the Intel based. One room is actually based on AMDs. Uh, so for example, based on your memory requirement, you specify a appropriate constraint. 
say for example if my job is more memory intensive accordingly you can actually select a um, cpu based architecture uh, this constraint already explained by mohan just i will skip this slide and large memory nodes uh, even uh, this one is actually explained by mohan say for example if you are actually interested to use um, for large memory the large memory node will be allocated only one only when uh, more than 370 gb memory is actually uh, required <coughs> the gpus i will skip uh, in a100 um, is actually in beta testing uh, saber and mohan explained in the previous slides uh, here um, you may actually received uh, your terms and conditions uh, from our uh, team lead uh, greg so if you are actually accepting the terms and condition followed by uh, pa approved uh, the ai usage ai 100 usage uh, then you will be actually added into a100 partition apart from ai 100 these are the various gpu configurations available at ipex uh, say for example uh, the gpu nodes are either four uh, gpu cards or eight gpu cards uh, this summary is actually given in this uh, table uh, say for example if your uh, ml or dl uh, job is actually looking for more than four gpus please use appropriate um, the architecture say for example uh, gtx and v100 are only available eight uh, more than four uh, gpu configurations so better to use um, based on your requirement say for example uh, either i need five gpus or six gpus then select v100 or uh, gtx architecture model <laughs> here uh, these are the various constraints um, like say for example in your gpu configuration is uh, um, required four gpus you you need to actually specify number of gpus how many gpus uh, you wanted to allocate <coughs> uh, for example if you are not specifying any number by default one gpu will be allocated uh, these are uh, the main uh, constraints about memory uh, say for example the memory configuration can be uh, done uh, via uh per node memory configuration per, per node memory configuration is actually used uh, by dash dash mem dash dash mem 100 it actually allocate 100 gb per node alternatively you can actually use memory per gpus uh, here on the example second i will be actually using memory per gpu is 8 gb uh, cpu per task is 8 so basically every gpu will be allocated 8 gb memory multiples of 8 total 64 gb i'll be actually allocating for most of the bioinformatics workload it's better to use uh, per node memory rather than per cpu based memory <coughs> in ibex we have four different file systems one is worm file system the worm file system is actually uh, available for every user so regular backup is actually done from worm file system in case if one of the if any of the user actually deleted uh, some of the files or uh, some of the data from home file system we may possible to recover from home file system this is fully backed up home file system the other file system is scratch the scratch file system is actually used to fight uh, all the users uh, in ibex by default 1.5 tb quota is actually allocated in scratch file system please note that these file systems are not backed up Uh, before deleting or before moving the data you need to be very caution uh, uh, deleting or moving out of ibex then third file system is project file system the project file system is actually allocated based on uh, the approval basis say for example once your pa is actually approved uh, you can actually use uh, you, we can actually allocate more than 1.5 tb uh, uh, tb quota uh, per project Um, this this actually required um, pa approval followed by rcse approval once it is actually placed you can actually use more than 1.5 uh, terabyte of uh, storage in your project the fourth one is encrypted storage encrypted is mainly used for human genome uh, projects uh, this file system is fully encrypted note that other than worm file system all the file systems are not backed up so Um, before moving or deleting the data you need to be very caution about um, working on these file systems uh, 
then uh, assume that if your job is actually waiting in the queue for a long time, how I can actually eliminate um, or improve my turnaround time. Uh, say for example, in my example one, I'm actually specified only 10 seconds and my uh, resource requirement is only one GPU and two GB memory. This may be allocated very quickly. The reason is because your wall clock time is very less and number of resources are very limited. So the allocation time is <coughs> very much uh, easy or very much simple. On the other hand, if you are actually allocating 14 days of the reservation followed by um, like the similar set of resources, the allocation time actually takes more time. The reason is actually because your wall clock time is so high. So in order to actually reduce uh, the execution time, a better use uh, your required uh, resources. Say for example, if my resource requirement is mainly required for very limited number of resources, that much number of resources only you need to specify in your job script file. Don't go more number of resources unless if you are not like you no know, interested to use. In case of uh, to improve your productivity, uh, here uh, most of the user are actually getting confused with uh, two different parameters. One is CPU per task, another one is number of a task per node. The CPU per task parameter is mainly used for bioinformatics workload. Uh, this is mainly focused about number of threads. Say for example, even if you are doing um, genome alignment or genome sequencing, mostly it actually related with the single node jobs. So number of thread will be actually executing within the node. So most of the bioinformatics users are actually recommended to use a CPU per task. This actually runs with more number of threads per node. On the other hand, if you are going with, um, um, if you are actually running with MPE based applications, task per node is actually appropriate. Say for example, number of tasks per node is 64. The 64 node, uh, 64 tasks can be run uh, within the node in case of AMD. In case of Intel, we need to actually split the 64 tasks across the node. So the first example is very much suitable for uh, bioinformatics workload. The second example is very much suitable for uh, MPA based jobs. So this is the example um, uh, how to use uh, the number of threads uh, at bioinformatics workload. Here, as you can see, uh, CPU per task 16, I specified the CPU per task 16 should be matched with the command line argument. In BWMM is one of the genome aligner, right? In, in the genome alignment, I'm actually specifying number of threads 16. This should match with CPU per task parameter. Then right, your scalability and performance will be much better when you are actually running uh, in <coughs> bioinformatics workload. Here, don't override your jobs. Say for example, this is my job script file. In my job script file, I specified CPU per task is 16 and number of thread is 16, I specified. However, in the command line, I'm actually trying to increase the CPU per task 32. Even if you are specifying CPU per task is 32, uh, the 32 tasks or 32 threads may not be actually used by the application. The reason is because number of tasks or number of threads specified in my application is only 16. In order to improve this performance, you need to specify um, a, a job environment variable called slurm per task. If you specify slurm per task, in the application parameter, how many, uh, this actually appropriate to take it from CP per task parameter. <coughs> so uh, try to use uh, most of the <coughs> job environment variables uh, in your job script file. Uh, in case of any help or support required, feel free to actually email uh, ibex at hpc.cows.edu uh, is our common website. Uh, once you actually created um, the ticket, uh, we will try to actually address uh, your uh, problems. Uh, say, for example, uh, when you are uh, trying to specify um, more uh, details, it should be actually explained uh, in self-explanatory. Say, for example, uh, in case if some of the user actually trying to uh, say why my job is failed, without job ID, we may not possible to track all the details. So in any of the ticket, uh, you need to actually specify more explanations and more uh, descriptions 
say for example um, what is your problem and why it is actually failed and give more details uh, in your ticket so that no we can be able, able to easily uh, debug uh, the problems uh, most of uh, in case if you are unfamiliar how to generate a job script file uh, we have a job script generator available on this website uh, from this job script generator we can actually like pick up um, what are your requirements on the left hand side say for example uh, uh, what processor you are actually looking for how much local storage you are looking for how much memory you are looking for per job then accordingly you can generate a job script file once the job script file is actually generated you can copy and paste into the terminal this actually gives um, a yeah, live or uh, online job script generator available at our uh, ibex website uh, after this presentation we will be actually posting all our training materials uh, in this uh, training session uh, you can actually see uh, a training tab under this training tab a previous recordings and previous presentations also available uh, after our presentation by today or tomorrow we will be posting all our training materials in this website for your reference so we, you can actually contact us uh, via the slack or a ticket our website is hpc.ibex.pouse.edu.sa/ibex uh, that's all i have thank you thank you so much so much for your attention and uh, over to mohan maybe you can actually broadcast um, your uh, q and a session Indeed. Thanks a lot, everyone. Um, so, uh, are there any Q and A's that need to be answered live? So I see a session uh, and the question about the tiers. Um, so yeah, um, it's it it will depend on the fields. It's it's not gonna be linked to AI only. So AI users will need to take the deep learning and distributed deep learning uh, to get to next tiers. But uh, if you are in the HPC field, you will have something else. Uh, so the IBEX one one is the prerequisites, and then it depends on your research topics. And some of the uh, discussions with some of our team members, uh, you will get bumped to the tiers based on the requirements and your uh, skill set and our recommendations. So if there are additional training that we feel is necessary in terms of HPC, if, uh, then we will uh, give you the support and the requirement, the required uh, knowledge to, to get into that. That's the question of Marcel. any more questions uh, so there are questions about uh slack channel how do you um yep. how do you um, join it so uh, basically we'll post it in chat and i believe naga it's available on hpc website as well right Yes, Mosen. It's actually available on website, HPC website. I am actually trying to uh, include him on the Slack channel. Yeah. So uh, uh, this is actually like um, uh, uh, on our presentation. Even if you actually click the link, automatically you can join because uh, this channel is uh, public. Anyone has uh, anyone has the cost credential, he can actually join without any approval. Agreed. So Marcel uh, asks about uh, LAMS, for, for example, uh, on IWAX. Um, unless you're, Marcel, unless you're using LAMS uh, on GPUs or intending to use that on GPUs, I think Shaheen might actually be a better uh, place for you. Um, That's correct, but uh, especially if you are running at larger scale and scaling up. Yeah. But if not, then basically there is a command module avail. Uh, you can add lamps and then it will give you all the possible installations. Uh, and you, you can pick the versions that are most current or the ones that you prefer to use. So I think this version is the latest one available as far as I know. Um, and that's the quick way to get uh, to 
uh, any modules. Same goes for the GCC, for example, GCC compiler, um, you would get uh, module FAL GCC would give you the few versions that are available there. Uh, so we have more recent versions if someone wants to go there. And for the lamps, same thing. So I hope that answers these questions. But again, for the very highly scalable, if you if you need more than if you start needing hundreds, several hundreds of cores, uh, I think uh, you can scale such codes on Shaheen much faster than easier. Right. Um, one gotcha in there is you need to log into iLogin in order to see that. That's correct. Yeah, cool. Um, if there is nothing else, we can move to the uh, quiz and make people's life difficult. It's so, <laughs> it's quite straight for the All right. So, um, I am going to launch the quiz. It's not timed, but uh, please answer them live. Uh, it should be on your screens now. Yeah. So if you have any difficulty looking at the um, quiz or interacting with the quiz box, please let us know in chat. So for those who are having difficulty uh, looking you know, and finding the quiz, it must be in a different pop-up uh, window. So have a look at uh, have a look around your desktop. There might be a pop-up window that would have opened. And uh, I, I believe yes. Uh, after after the quiz, you may leave. Yes, thank. You.
Right. Um, it appears that uh, most of the people attending have answered almost all the questions, except for a few, oh, well, all of them have. Okay. Yeah, so Saber, over to you for closing. Oh, thank you very much, Mohsen, and uh, thank you all for your nice presentations. I hope that was useful and worthwhile your time and, uh, and participation. And thanks for the users for uh, joining us today and participating in all the nice questions because that helps the interactivity. We are here for you to help and support uh, with any means possible. Uh, you have our contacts and channels to reach out to us and we'll be happy to work with you moving forward to accelerate your science uh, achievement. Um, with that, uh, I guess that's uh, the end of today's morning session. Uh, and if you are interested in computational biology or deep learning, uh, register and join at 2 p.m. today uh, for the respective session. Thank you very much and have a good one. Thank you. See you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Yes, we'll share the answers. Thanks. <laughs>